Previously on Eugene's A Traveling Drummer's Diary. Das ist der DJ Paul Elstag, Junge! Why do you follow me? Leave the lights on. You can't see s***. Hey, Papa. Yeah. Let's work. Is Brian gonna jump again from the balcony? I'm back. Hello everyone, I'm Eugene and welcome back to another episode of the Traveling Drummer's Diary Saga. This is the fifth and final part of the Vital Remains 2016 EU Mexican tour as well as the last vlog about them. So strap in one last time and let's finish this never-ending tour with the final showdown in Mexico. As you know, the events of this vlog chapter were happening in 2016. Even though I have shown you a lot of footage in past episodes about flights, this was a special one for me because it was my very first transatlantic flight and in addition the very first flight on my own. This kind of situation can pose a lot of threats and many things can go totally wrong if you're inexperienced. When you're traveling all together as a band, you move in the airport as a band. The herd instinct helps a lot. You subconsciously take care of each other, pay attention that no one gets left behind even if you don't intend to do so. If you're all by yourself like I was, you're out there in the jungle, the consequences can be grave. But more on this towards the end of this video. I stocked up on some sustenance that I consumed before my first flight. On my way to Mexico City, I had a layover in Paris. I heard it a few times from my fellow musicians later that the Charles de Gaulle airport was kinda infamous. Basically the viper room of airports for some reason. Yeah, it was huge and expensive like a lot of other airports I guess. For me it was an adventure. I could not hate that place because it had a PS4 in the international terminal. I had an over expensive sandwich before I boarded my intercontinental flight to Mexico. I was flying with Aira Mexico which turned out to be the viper room of airlines, speaking from personal experience. Honestly, the biggest thing I dreaded is the time I had to kill on this never-ending flight. Locked in a transport 10,000 meters above sea level with no gas station stops whatsoever. With time and experience, I learned to love these long flights more than anything else. You can sleep, watch movies, eat or do some very useful and time-consuming laptop work like editing vlogs. The lavatories are totally awesome and much cleaner than in the Nightliner. In a nutshell, 12 hours spent on a flight like this fly by in an instant. The crew usually offers some kind of dinner in the form of a meat dish or pasta in my case as well as some light snacks in the morning an hour before landing as breakfast. As for jet lag, it is a serious issue for any performing musician of course and impacts all of us as travelers. Unfortunately, I cannot give you any useful advice at this point on how to handle it easily. So for now all we can do is just listen to some Andrew Huberman podcast on how to fix your sleep. But I definitely want to incorporate some of his methods in order to simplify my tour life. So hopefully I'll teach you about this in future future vlogs because my own performance suffered from this countless times. I have landed in Mexico City somewhere around 4 am and had to take one last flight to get to Tijuana. Back in 2016 November in Tijuana, it was hot as shit. Before I was picked up by the local promoter in the airport, I just grabbed the quick emparedado. The rest of the band has already landed the day before, so we headed to their hotel to pick them up. Now, I don't want to be the guy who's bad-mouthing things too much, but according to statistics, Tijuana is the most dangerous and violent city in the world. On an average, almost 7 people are killed here daily. The main reasons behind this violence are human trafficking and drug trades by different gangs. Another reason for the violence is a rivalry between the Sinaloa and Tijuana cartels. Upon arrival to the hotel, the promoter said, do not leave the building. You go left, kidnapping. Go right, being mugged. Straight down the street, murder. You decide. Plata or plomo. <laughs> Luckily we had a decent hotel room with air conditioning because the heat was unbearable otherwise. The balcony also provided a nice view across the border all the way to San Diego where I'm gonna get in 2019 eventually and legally of course. Closer to the show in the evening I started feeling like the jet lag was seriously kicking my ass at this point. I had a really hard time warming up in the room. The place we played in Tijuana was called Safari Club and for a reason. It was a small built stage in a courtyard of some sort filled with palm trees and most notably sand. Which was everywhere, not only under our feet but also on stage and inside all the gear. In addition to this challenge, my Roland TD6V trigger module didn't want to work. First I thought it might have gotten damaged during the flight, but later it turned out it was just the difference in voltage output between the European and American systems. Tip number 78, before traveling abroad make sure you check 
check what type of outlet and voltage output is required for most electronics. Back in 2016, I didn't know shit about bringing an adapter with me for an overseas trip. A huge thanks goes to David Paris of the Mirage Theory who was kind enough to lend me his Roland TM2, which I was using for the first time ever and had absolutely no clue or time how to configure properly, so my performance was a complete disaster. Next day early in the morning, it was time to say goodbye to this cartel plaza. Next up, Monterey Corona Northside Festival. From what I know, Monterey is considered to be a tad safer than Tijuana for sure. At least you're not at the risk of a heat stroke. The weather here is much more humid and bearable. The show we were supposed to play in the city was a huge open air festival with rockstar level bands. Even though we played very early during the afternoon, we still nevertheless received luxurious treatment. We were sharing the same hotel with all the big bands, bumping into celebrities in the lobby all the time. The hotel itself was absolutely stunning. Comfortable beds. Beautiful clean bathrooms with cappuccino from the tap. And obviously an all-you-can-eat touring nutrition buffet which I abused to its fullest. After my dirty bulk, I headed out to the city for an important side quest. Luckily we were performing the next day, so I had time to fix my trigger module. Our hotel was close to the city center, so I took a walk looking for an electronic store. Eventually I managed to buy a new adapter with a voltage switch and of course it solved my problem. The weather was rather nasty, but it was my only chance to look around and I quite enjoyed this walk. Didn't feel like I was going to be kidnapped by a cartel or something. Lovely neighborhood. I'll revisit Monterey and future vlogs with Belfagor, so stay tuned for more. Next day, we headed to the festival area. We had our own private driver with a van who was basically babysitting us for the whole day. Anytime you wanted to go back to the hotel for a quick nap or something, Reynaldo was at your service. Yeah. As well as, of course, we had our own backstage container, which is a typical utility for a festival of such caliber. Equipped with basic necessities such as comfy couches, green plants, ice-cold beverages, delicious snacks, exciting entertainment, and friendly personnel. Some bands were badass enough to have their own Wi-Fi. Not us, though. One day, Eugene. One day. Obviously, with bands of such importance, everything has to run like a Swiss clock according to schedule. It was time to head to the stage and check out the equipment. Unfortunately, I didn't record this glorious event, just took a quick picture of my setup. And maybe it was for the best, because my performance was pretty bad. We had around 25-30 minutes to make the quick changeover and I had to reassemble the kit. I think I had 8 people who were my designated drum tech stage crew. And none of them spoke a single word of English. So it was all running around and screaming in chaos, pointing and using body language of any sort. The kit was falling apart and we barely started in time, so now you can understand the pressure I was under. The rain was pouring mercilessly, but we had probably about 5,000 people watching us. It was insanely awesome. Immediately after the show, we packed our stuff and it was time to do some meet and greet with the fans, followed by interviews, which was also pretty wild. Just walks from 10 to 10, did like 5-6 of them in a row. The people were very friendly and excited. We burn down churches. We love Mexico. After some Jack Daniels, apparently, I felt comfortable with my Spanish and wanted some female attention. What can I do? Got bored of this rock star life pretty quickly, it seems. Later in the evening, we could walk around and watch other bands perform from the side of the stage. One of the highlights of that evening was meeting and watching Eli Casagrande of Sepultura, probably the hardest hitting drummer in his genre, a true inspiration. When he's beating the shit out of his kit, all the elevators nearby go out of order. <laughs> Tip number 79. Watching someone like Eli perform instantly increases your personal bench press record by 10 kilos at least. And obviously the headlining act put quite a show as well. Not a huge KISS fan or anything, but it was epic. Back at the hotel, one last nap in the 5 star bed, next day morning one last 5 star dirty bulk breakfast. It was time for a short drive to the next show and we were taken there by a regular commercial bus that was rented for the band promoter's crew. Next stop, final 28th gig of the tour, Saltillo, Mexico. much to say about the gig in Saltillo to be honest. We stopped before going to the venue at a house of some sort to get some food and maybe a quick nap. I guess some of the guys wanted to do a barbecue or something. We were just tired and wanted to recover before the show.
The venue itself was nothing special, basic necessities including stage fans, power outlets in the backstage and so on. My performance was mediocre and I guess we all just wanted to finally go home. Drove back to Monterey and next day we were saying our final goodbyes before flying home. The guys back to the States and Canada, me to Europe through Mexico City. Or at least that was my intended plan but the universe had something else prepared for me unfortunately. In order to understand what happened I will once again remind you that this was my very first intercontinental trip. As far as I recall on my way to Mexico I was checked in for all my flights from Vienna to Paris, Mexico City and Tijuana. I think all I had to do is just to pick up my extra boarding pass in Mexico City at the counter. Since I was flying with Aeromexico both ways I was sure this will be the exact case on my way home. All my luggage was checked in back in Monterey and I was supposed to fly through Mexico City, Amsterdam to Vienna. So after my flight from Monterey to Mexico City I was just chilling because I had a couple of hours before flying to Europe. About an hour before my flight I go to the counter to pick up my boarding pass. So here I am told, we cannot give you the boarding pass because you are not registered for this flight. Perplexed I reply, alright then I'd like to register please. They say, registration for this flight was closed 5 minutes ago, there's nothing we can do, f*** off please. Tip number 80, don't wait till last moment to get your boarding pass, the sooner you acquire it the smaller the chance things will go the Eugene way. All you can do sir, they continued, is to go and try to get rebooked for a different flight by the airlines. Alright, I thought to myself, let's give it a shot. So I took the monorail train and went to the other terminal. Over there at Aeromexico they said, we can rebook you for a later flight through London in a few hours. Bloody brilliant old champ, I replied, let's do it. No 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 senor, you cannot be rebooked until your luggage is in transfer on the old flight. Due to safety regulations you are not allowed to fly separately from your luggage. So you have to wait till it gets rejected since you didn't board your original flight and then you can check in. And by the time that happens you obviously are going to be late for the London flight as well. While I'm picking up my return drum gear I'm calling my dad telling him how much I like Mexico and I decided to stay. An additional layer of pressure is the monorail train between terminals is slowly closing because it's almost 11 pm. And no need to say the airport is so huge, good luck walking. So the people at Aeromexico say the next flight to Vienna is in 24 hours from now basically and it costs a fortune. For some reason they didn't want to accept my card, just plata o plomo. My hands trembling in front of the ATM hoping I can actually get the cash from it. That amount was equal to a large portion of my hard earned tour money. Almost one month being sick, fever, ear inflammation, 280 BPM health shows every night, all that on. My reward? Gone in a blink of an eye. You're not a true traveler until you fuck up like this. I fucked up big time. So where can I spend the night I wonder? They say, our airport hotel prices start at $150 per night. I go, bendejo, I just spent my last puta peso on a new ticket. After a second they reply, terminal 1 has benches. So I googled the place nearby which was the cheapest. An old man opened the door and spoke a bit of English. How much can you offer? I replied, the website said 40 bucks per night. After a pause he says 50 dollars. First I wanted to stand my ground and bargain but then I remembered local traditions. Plata. So we struck a deal. I locked the door to my room and put a small desk in front of it just in case. The room itself was probably 3 by 3 meters. There was nothing but the bed, glass missing from the window. At this point I couldn't care less. I was too desperate and exhausted. Moments later cried myself to sleep. So next day morning I wake up and leave my 5 star hotel. My new flight home was scheduled at 11 pm so I had the whole day to keep myself busy somehow. I dropped all my drum gear in a locker at the airport and headed towards the city center to look around. As long as I don't get mugged during the day my adventures cannot be worse than what I already experienced yesterday. No need to say Mexico City is huge, getting from the airport to the city center took me a while. I recall there was a funny dude in the subway selling USB sticks, iPhone chargers and flashlights. It was pretty dark down there and he didn't stop pointing the flashlights in your face until you buy one. Marketing at its finest. Upon arriving to the main square I wanted to take a guided bus trip to the Teotihuacan pyramids near the city. But unfortunately I was late for the last trip of that day. In case you wanted to see them I will visit the pyramids in 2018 when I'll be back to Mexico again with Belfagor. It was one of the coolest places I have ever visited and I'll definitely include it in a future diary episode. For now I just walked around some ruins in the city as an appetizer and visited a museum with some architecture. Honestly nothing special. Later I had some absolutely terribly nasty street tacos. I chose the dirtiest place I could find on purpose to have the most immersive experience possible. Not a very huge fan of tacos but I absolutely loved it. 
After that, I went back to the airport about 5 hours prior to my flight to make sure I don't miss it again. If you paid close attention in past vlogs, I already gave similar advice about my flight home from Brazil in 2017. The others have already left and I had no chance to contact anyone. After everything I have been through, there was no way I would miss my flight home. Tip number 39. While catching your flight home, make sure you have a plan B. You don't want to spend all your tour money on a new plane ticket. Does this sound painfully familiar to you, 2016 Eugene? If only 2017 Eugene could have warned you about this. Well, this basically concludes my trip and this whole tour. But before we finish this video, I'd like to get a bit sentimental for a moment. This is my final vlog with Vital Remains as of now. I did three big tours with them, 48 shows in total. They were the first big international band that hired me as a session drummer for tours of such calibers. Back in August 2016 when I was asked to play for them, I agreed without hesitation. And yet, I was 100% sure I cannot pull off their stuff, no chance at all, but I felt like this was my big shot. So if you're looking for a motivational kick... I hope my story will be able to inspire you at least somehow. Are you afraid of the unknown and jumping into fire? We all are, but that's the only way to grow. This experience encouraged me to do it over and over again in the future with Balfagor, Decapitated and Flash God. I wanted to thank Brian for his funny stories, always keeping everyone entertained and in a good mood. Gator, who supported and cared for me during my sickness. And Dean, who although is younger than me, was definitely a more mature person than I'll ever be. He welcomed me in the band as a brother and always encouraged me to keep going when I was down. Last but not least, and most importantly, Tony, who of course was the one offering me to join the band and made all these dreams a reality for me. Thanks to these crazy and tough challenges I learned a lot and grew not only as a musician, but as a person. If it was not for Vital Remains, I wouldn't be where I am now. This experience helped me prepare for my next adventures. I don't know if our paths will cross again or if we'll share the stage. Life is unpredictable, you can never know. Once again, I am very grateful to them and I wish them the best of luck. Next time, we're gonna start a whole new big chapter of adventures with Belfagor, which is gonna bring extreme metal drumming tour vlogs to a whole new level of epicness. Lots of new stuff to learn and experience. You have not seen anything like this, mark my word. So I hope to be back with a new episode of the Traveling Drummer's Diary Saga very soon. Till then, take care. Eugene, out. Impressed by this precision? Me too. This is all achievable thanks to the Foot Blaster trigger. Make sure that you head to footblaster.com and use the code Eugene in order to get a discount for your next Foot Blaster trigger purchase. Plata o plomo. Luckily, we had a decent hotel room with air conditioning.